I don't know if they can handle so many awesome people in one space. I think that's why it's taking so long. Oh, meeting is now streaming. Okay, so we should be live. So let me get off here. Okay, so thank you for joining us for our pop culture panel series. This panel will be all about Star Wars. This event is in partnership with Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore, where you can purchase books by our guest authors. I want to take a moment to thank Mysterious Galaxy for collaborating with us on this event and give a shout out to Haiti Smith, the Special Events Coordinator of Mysterious Galaxy, for all of her work. So thank you to Haiti. Thank you to our panelists for being here today. That is Lindsay Sapak, Delay, Delilah S. Dawson, Adam Rex, and Ian Desher. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to chat with you. I am your co-host for this panel, Jessica Buck. And I'm your other co-host, Dan Wood, qualifications being I'm a Star Wars nerd. And I also oversee the uh, youth services and literacy departments here. So thank you again for all of our panelists joining us today. We'll be monitoring the comments. So if there are any questions for our authors or our cosplayer here, please add those to the comments. Ask the questions and you could win one of three Baby Yoda stickers designed by local business Daydream. All right, why don't we roll into our question? Jessica, why don't you kick us off? Okay, so let's hear a little bit about you. Let's start with Delilah. Okay, um, I'm Delilah S. Dawson. <laughs> I am an author who writes uh, Star Wars books, starting with Phasma was my first one. Um, and then I wrote Galaxy's Edge, Black Spire as well, uh, the Skywalker Saga. So they're all right there because like my proudest babies. <laughs> um, and then I was also in the From a Certain Point of View uh, anthologies, and I have written some Star Wars Adventures comics. Yes, big boys. So yeah, Star Wars, big time Star Wars geek. Um, and uh, today's, today's the, the happy day. Like it's been so joyful to be on Twitter and get pinged in like cosplays and book pictures. Like I love that Star Wars has created its own holiday because like we got our butts kicked for this when we were kids and now we have our own holiday. Yeah, we are excited. So let's see, how about Lindsay? So I am Lindsay Seapock. I am actually the second in command of the Imperial Sands Garrison, which is the local San Diego uh, Garrison uh, group of the uh, 501st. And if you don't know what the 501st is, the 501st Legion is basically an all volunteer organization we are costume enthusiasts for Star Wars. You have, we're strictly the bad guys, of course. And we are 14,000 strong across the world. And not only do we promote interest in Star Wars through the building and wearing of screen accurate costumes, we also do a great deal of work through contributions through the local community of charity and volunteer work. That is our main drive is to do uh, charity work while in costume to promote Star Wars and also to, to promote um, community building and things like that. And I've been into Star Wars forever, <laughs> but really uh, the, the, when the sequels came out, I really, really kicked my butt into gear and I got into it. And that's when I joined the 501st and fell head, headlong into it. And as you can see, uh, Hux is my, one of my favorite bad guys ever. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, how about you, Ian? A little bit about you. Uh, my name is Ian Desher, and uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm the author of the William Shakespeare's Star Wars books. Um, I've been lucky enough to do all nine of the uh, main Skywalker episodes uh, in that format. And uh, later on this year, I'll have my uh, first non-Shakespeare book uh, coming out. It's called I Wish I Had a Wookiee, and it is a book of children's poetry. Um, so uh, that'll, be, that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, so I'm thrilled to be here. I actually thought I would really quickly uh, read a poem from that collection called Star Wars Day. Uh, so here it is. The 4th of May is the perfect date, our family's chance to celebrate. We wake up early, we can't wait, and put some waffles on a plate. My homeroom's missing this classmate. It's just this once, my parents state. The movies have begun by eight. We watch each episode through straight. The pizza comes while troops create a new Death Star to spread their hate. My parents have a small debate. Mom likes R2, Dad BB-8. 
We finish up the movies late and still don't know each hero's fate. I'm tired, so I don't hesitate. I crawl in bed to hibernate. My mother whispers to me, Kate, dear, may the force be with, may the fourth be with you. Great. So that's me. Oh, I love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm excited to hear more later for the questions. Okay, Adam, you are the last. Yeah, my name is Adam Rex. Uh, I write and illustrate kids' books mostly, and I, my contribution to, let's say, the extended Star Wars universe is a picture book called Are You Scared, Darth Vader? And uh, Star Wars is literally, I'm just old enough that it's the first movie I remember seeing in a theater. So I was four years old when it came out. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it's been literally part of my entire conscious life, if not my entire life. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. We're so excited. So Dan, on to the next question, which some yeah, of you kind of answered, but. Yeah, it does kind of lead very nicely in literally what is your first memory of Star Wars? So Adam, why don't we start with you? I think you had said that literally the first movie was there anything else tied to that? Yeah, I mean, I, the funny thing is that I, I swear, looking back on it now, my strongest memory of going to see Star Wars when I was four years old with my brother and dad and uncle was the movie theater lobby. I was really taken with the movie theater lobby. And I'm not, I realize that's not the, the best Star Wars memory to share, but there were like origami spaceships hanging from it. And that's what really hit me. I wonder to what degree I really remember seeing the movie or I just instead maybe remember more the play sessions with my older brother where we recreated the movie over and over again with the you know first line of, of action figures that came out. So it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely not overstating it to say that I, I barely have a memory from my childhood that wasn't influenced or, or tinted in some way by Star Wars, but I, it might have been my second or third watching of the movie that is the, the viewing that really stuck with me. That is awesome. I think there's, I, and having read your book, I can kind of see those memories play out in Are You Scared Darth Vader a little bit with the kids' playfulness and all that. That's so amazing. Delilah, how about yourself for Star Wars memory? Well, I was born in the tail end of 1977, so I, I I couldn't have seen it in the theater when it came out, so I, I don't get that clout, but it was just always there. You know, like there were always the action figures there, or there were always, uh, you know, I had like the, the book that R2D2 would bing when your record needed to be turned over, uh -huh. like that old school. Um, but my, my most startling memory is that my grandparents bought, uh, there was a set of sheets that came out with Empire. They were like very blue. You can see people repurposing them at all of the cons. And me and my cousin Danny would fight over who got to sleep in the bed with the, the Star Wars sheets. And they're finally like, we were both the same, they were like, just sleep in the same bed, just don't touch, just pull it down the middle, like whatever, stop fighting. And I woke up one in the middle of the night and he was like projectile vomiting all over the bed. And I was like, not all the Star Wars sheets! <laughs> so yeah, I was like, I was just really upset. I did not care that he was sick. I was just really mad about him puking on the Star Wars sheets. So like, it's it's in there deep. I had the exact same sheets and I, I probably threw up on them too at some point. <laughs> So Ian, uh, do you have any sheets about throwing up on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, undoubtedly. Uh, uh, I was also born in 1977, uh, about six weeks after the movie came out. Um, and I remember very well, very clearly our Empire Strikes Back wallpaper uh, on the wall of my brother's room uh, growing up. Uh, and for me, my first memory of the, the movies, I saw Return of the Jedi in the theater when I was six. And I remember my my uncle um, translating in Japanese to his spouse as the movie was going on. Um, uh, and, and even at the time thinking, wow, how do you, how are you translating this job of the hut scene, right? Like uh, <laughs> for her. Um, so yeah, so uh, like Adam and Delilah grew up with, with it just in the air everywhere. And then uh, Lindsay, how about yourself? So I'm, I was born in 84, so I, before, I didn't get to see any of the originals in theaters, but I remember my, one of my grandmothers, and I don't know if it was her toy or one of my aunts, but there was an old R2-D2, like, remote control, very old, like, 
you would turn it on and it would beep boop and like roll across the floor. I still have it actually, and it still works. Um, but that was something that like was introduced to me at a very early age. And I was like, what is this R2D2? What is this from? And my mother and my dad who were both big sci-fi people were like, oh, it's from Star Wars. And that we had the VHSs and I just wore them out. Like I, and got really, really into it. And then of course, you know, ever since then I was in love with it. I was really into the book. I was really into the books for a very long time. I, well, I mean, I still am, but like through elementary school and middle school, I was very, very deep into Star Wars Legends. What is now the Legends hardcore. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next question is, oh, hold on. I'm using a Google Doc, so when <clears throat> the curse is on there, it shows that the anonymous narwhal is also there, so it blocks some of my question. Okay, what is it about the Star Wars franchise or world that you think appeals to readers of all ages? And who have we not started with? So let's start with you, Ian. Um, I mean, these stories are, I think it's that these stories are such a part of our culture and, and um, you know, just everywhere you go around the world, people know Star Wars. And so the chance to get to delve deeper into characters through books and uh, through any, through, through anything, whether it's the movies or TV shows or, or anything like I think that's what people love is just they want more and more of this story that is so uh, so much a part of um, of who we all are as people. Yeah, absolutely. There's just there's so much because there's not just like the movies and all the fan made stuff. It's like it just it keeps expanding and getting more and more and more and more. And let's see, Delilah. I think there's just something for everyone within the, the Star Wars universe. You know, if you're into, you know, young adult, there's young adult books. If you're a middle grade kid, there's middle grade kids books. If you want a humorous graphic novel, we've got those. If you prefer your adult books about aliens and adventures, we have those. If you prefer them about uh, diplomacy and strategy, we have those. If you want to read about the X-Wings, we have those. They've been so careful to kind of look at everybody's interests and, and find a place for them. But I think if you're a person who maybe hasn't found their place in other other realms, you can come to Star Wars and you can just slide right into your niche and be like, oh my God, you like the cute animals, I like the cute animals too. You like to cosplay, I like to cosplay. You like to make the Star Wars cupcakes, I like that. Like there's just something for everybody. I mean, every time I go to Celebration, it just blows my mind the way that people get to come together over what were once like very, you know, very niche specialized things. And you can find other people that are gonna geek out over it with you. Speaking of geeking out, Lindsay. <laughs> You know, I, I think Star Wars is one of the few franchises that I think speaks to everyone and that everyone can find their, their place in the world. They're obviously like, there's the huge epic battles with the light side and the dark side and the Jedi and the Sith and all of that. But you know, if a kid's into pirates, they've got the smugglers. And also like there's such a wide array of aliens who are all different types of people that a kid can find themselves in a character and that character most likely will appear in some other form. So like there's a home for everyone in Star Wars somewhere. Like no matter what, the world is always expanding and people will always be able to find a home there. And I think that is why it speaks so deeply to us and why people are so passionate about creating things like costumes and just needle stitch and helmets. And I mean, just epic doing full builds of ships, like the one that's that someone did of, you know, in Russia, like it speaks so deeply to people because everyone can find something that is is them. And I think that is very unique to Star Wars and it is why it is so important and that it keeps expanding for adults all the way to kids. And it's just so unique. It's, it's, it's why it's my favorite. <laughs> and Adam. Yeah, just to piggyback on, I think on what uh, Lindsay and Delilah, Delilah were saying, I think there is something for everyone, but there was a time 
when there weren't YA novels and Jedi Academy uh, chapter books and cosplayers. All, there was a time when all we had was one movie. And even that movie, I think, in a way that had never even really been tried previous to this, had something for everyone. I, I, I actually kind of looked at some of the other movies that were released in 1977 or, or in 1976, the year before, and Star Wars kind of invented the four quadrant blockbuster movie where it was, it was making something that could appeal to me at four years old, but could also appeal to my parents or even my grandparents possibly. And, you know, the, the most popular movie of 1976 was Rocky. That was the big blockbuster. Like, I don't think the kids were, you know, rushing off to see that or playing Rocky in their backyard to the same degree that they were playing Star Wars in their backyard the next year. And in, in 1977, I think the closest blockbuster to Star Wars was maybe Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which is still a very different kind of sci-fi movie and, and one that'd be pretty alienating to young kids. And so I think, you know, they just, they went for something that had never really been tried before, where they said, we're going to have silly things and, and aliens with cute names and slapstick. And we're also going to have something that's going to inspire the adults who are going to see it too. So that it became such a phenomenon that kids kind of had this, this permission to grow up with it. And, and when you had the kids, when, when this coincided with them pretty much reinventing the whole toy market with the action figures, you had a time in history where people could not see the same movie over and over again. We didn't even have VCRs back then, but you had for the first time the, the kids that were just replaying the movie over and over again in their own way with these figures and, and telling the same stories over and over again with little idols like that you're halfway to a religion at that point. Like that, that's how religions begin, that you're retelling the same stories with, with idols and symbols. And I'm probably taking this way too far, but I feel like that's the reason why all these decades later, we're all still a little bit too worked up over this thing that we saw when we were kids. That's, yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. I had not considered that before. I feel like there's an entire dissertation right in that or a book or some kind. So I've got a really hard hitting question for all of you. Favorite lightsaber color? Delilah, why don't we start with you? Oh, mine's purple. <laughs> Lindsay. Orange. All right, Ian. Green. And Adam. I think in my head, there are still only three lightsaber colors, so blue. <laughs> Very good. I feel like we should have asked for justification. Like, why <laughs> this color? Like, what is the meaning behind this? Well, if you're asking me, I mean, I, if you had asked me when I was a kid, I probably would have said red, but um, that just, like, I'm not, you know, evil. So I, you know, my choice is blue or, or green and, you know, Blue just seems like a good middle of the road color to, to latch on to. See, I would have said purple like you, Delilah, because it's just such a nice color. Well, I just remember and it's like royalty. When Mace Window, Mace Window pulls his out, and you're like, finally, like we've been waiting, like, of course it's yours, like, of course, but yeah. It was but I, I remember reading there was pushback on that, right? He he wanted purple and they told him, no, there, there are no purple lightsabers. Who says just no to Samuel <laughs> Jackson? <laughs> Well, nobody apparently because he got his way, but like he warped the entire mythology just with, you know, a little bit of like diva-ish intransigence that he wanted his purple lightsaber. And now there's, you know, a whole Skittles rainbow of lightsabers, but I, there was still a time when you could only have three RGB. So the next question, I'm gonna change it a little bit for you, Lindsay, but what's your favorite character that you wrote and why did you choose to focus on that character? And Lindsay, for you would be like, who did you choose to dress up as and why? So let's start. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. So let's, I'm gonna start with Ian. Who's your favorite character that you wrote and why did you choose them? Or choose to include them or just like them? Well, in my case, I didn't 
uh, I didn't so much choose to include characters because I was sort of rewriting the, the movies. I think for me, it was, I got to do some fun things with different characters. So like, so like Mace Windu, I worked in the title of a Samuel L. Jackson movie into each one of his lines, which was really fun. And like turning Yoda's lines all into haiku, you know, like uh, just these, these different things that I got to do that, that Lucasfilm let me do, uh, which was huge. Um, so it was, it was things like that, that just like gave me a chuckle. And I hope, uh, hope is fun for people who are reading them too. Oh yeah, I love Yoda. Like whenever Yoda, <laughs> I was trying to find something because I have the book right here, but it's like Yoda in general, like sounds awesome when he talks. And then like you, <laughs> you have him in this environment, it's just fantastic. Okay, how about Adam? Just favorite character that you wrote or featured in your books and why you chose? I mean, I only wrote the one. So uh, I, when I was approached by Lucasfilm Books, you know, to basically see if I had uh, an idea for a Star Wars Halloween book for them. That's, that's how this began. And it kind of strayed from that a little bit. But I pitched them a few things with a lot of different characters. But uh, this, this was the best one. And luckily, this is the one that they picked. So I only really got to, to write Vader. Awesome. And Delilah. I, I'm real attached to uh, to by Marathi and, and to Cardinal and to Phasma too. But I think that the characters that you create sometimes, uh, you know, you, you get a real kind of like familial kind of attachment to them, like they're your babies. Um, you know, with Vi, we needed to create a, a female spy that we wanted to be kind of like the, the female counterpart to Poe Dameron. And because I've actually like met her and seen her at Galaxy's Edge, she's the most real thing. Um, and then of course, Cardinal is her foil because we wanted to look at what would be uh, well, the question was, you know, surely in the first order, there are good people, like there are good people who have joined up, they take these kids and they raise them. And you don't go into this being like, I want to be a bad guy, I want to grow up and do bad stuff. But there's have to be people who are like, I'm saving the galaxy, like I was an orphan, and they saved me and they fed me and like, I'm saving the galaxy for you. And it's like, what would a good person look like in the first order? And so that's cardinal. Um, so getting to write those two was uh, very heart rending and special getting to show how brutal phasma is and the, the crucible that she was born in was super satisfying. Um, but then there's also, <laughs> that's beautiful. But then there's also the part where like certain of the, especially the, the very first Star Wars characters when you get to write them, it's, it's like I've heard Han Solo's voice in my head my whole life. So writing him, it's like, I'll write his lines and like they don't get changed because obviously that's what he said because you hear him, you, and we internalize these people. So anytime I get to write the canon characters, I get like super excited. It's like channeling God, basically. And just really quickly, speaking of Han Solo's voice, I hope everybody saw uh, Mark Thompson's video um, that he did where he, for Star Wars Day this year, where he is um, doing a bunch of different characters around his house. Uh, Mark Thompson's an audiobook narrator who does a lot of Star Wars books. If you haven't, uh, after this, do yourself a favor, Google it. You'll be glad you did. That sounds amazing. I was like, don't Google it now. Don't Google it now. You won't mess up. <laughs> you won't pay attention if Mark Thompson is talking. That's right. <laughs> okay, so Lindsay, favorite character in life? So obviously, like I'm very, very fond of Hux. Um, if you just, one of the things I truly love about Hux is that if you just, just watch the movies, he is actually pretty one dimensional. Um, he has, he has an arc, his, it's an okay arc, but it is not, he, he's not real three dimensional, but if you delve into the books, uh, if you delve into Phasma, especially, uh, which is where he gets to wear a robe, which I have made, <laughs> <laughs> I have made the robe he wears. Uh, he, and in uh, some of the comic books he's in and some of the other, the, he's in a couple other books and small parts here and there. Like he has become a full three-dimensional character who genuinely thinks he's doing the right thing for an incredibly, I mean, he thinks he's doing the right thing. He, he, he is an incredibly complex character. Everything he does is incredibly wrong. He, he has done horrible, horrible things and there is no excuse for that. 
but it, it is one of the things that I truly appreciate at Star Wars that they create three-dimensional characters. And while you can consume just the movies and enjoy a character just from the movies, there's always secondary material such as the books where if you find a character that you like, there's always more information in the books that will flesh out that character and make you love them and have a better understanding of them. Like when I tell people about Hux's backstory, they're always blown away because they don't know about it. And I'm like, well, you should read these books. You should read this comic. <laughs> and I mean, like Phasma's entire story is, she's the ter most terrifying character in the first order if you've read her book. And it is, it's great. Like she's, she's scarier than Kylo in a lot of ways. And I love, I love that. Like I, I genuinely lo love characters that are in the books because instead of having two hours to look at a character, you have, you know, five, five hours in a book to read. And then they may get a sequel book or a prequel. Like there's always more time to expand a character, even if after they've died, a book can do more and in all different forms. And, you know, Hux, Hux has given me a lot, <laughs> despite being a very horrible man. <laughs> and real quick, sorry, but like, one of the things I truly enjoy about Hux is that he's unique in the way that he is, he seems less threatening. He doesn't have any powers, but he's like Tarkin, but more, but young. So he's accomplished so much in so little time. It's a very unique situation and it shows you how terrifying and powerful young people can be when they are, you know, brainwashed and given, you know, indoctrination and- And daddy issues. And a huge daddy. <laughs> okay, uh, this actually does touch upon our next question. Um, so this is for all the authors and we'll modify this for Lindsay. Uh, did you have any fun or interesting research you did for the books that you wrote or the characters that you work to dress up as? So why don't we start with Ian? Um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time uh, on different websites, things like, I mean, like Shakespearean websites, ones that would, would help me like, oh, did Shakespeare ever use this word? And if so, can I use that or can I use something else? But then uh, I think one of the most fun thing was, was um, with, the, with the sequel series, I wrote those really quickly after the movies came out um, and before, you know, before there were any sort of answers about anything. And with, uh, with the Rise of Skywalker, I was able to actually uh, write a note to folks at Lucasfilm and say, uh, hey, so what is that thing the Emperor is connected to, right? Like, can, tell me about that and what that is so that I can actually work it in some. So it was that sort of thing where it's like, oh, I'm get, I feel like I'm getting a little, a little insider information here. Uh, that's, that was the most fun research, yeah. Uh, Adam, how about yourself? Oh, mine is probably the most research-free uh, contribution to the Star Wars universe ever. But I was, after I turned in my first draft of it, I, I was told that while I had Vader's voice down all, all right, um, that Vader did not use contractions. So I needed to re remove all the contractions. So I, I wasted a, a, a afternoon, an afternoon just uh, like, fast forwarding to all the Vader scenes I could find in the original trilogy and going like, contraction, contraction. <laughs> it uses a lot, but James Earl Jones's voice is so stentorian and great that it just sounds like he never uses contractions. So that, I mean, that was basically all my research, but maybe this is a time to, I did want to show you some ske sketches and stuff like that. Do you think now would be the time to do that? Yeah. I can share my screen. Why not? Um, so you should be able to. So I'm going to uh, wait. Where's um, pardon me? That should have been keynote. There we go. So do you see keynote right now? You see the Death Star? Yeah. Oh, we see Vader yeah, saying what? Right now. I think we're still seeing what you originally shared. Yeah. How about now? Yes. 
All right. So this is the yeah. title page of Are You Scared, Darth Vader? Um, and this is basically a totally non-canonical uh, exploration of, of what Darth Vader himself might be afraid of, because of course, Darth Vader is just, you know, the scariest thing any kid can imagine. Um, so Darth lands on uh, a sort of a swamp Dagobah-ish sort of planet, and the narrator is throwing just like uh, uninspired classic monsters at him, and Vader is is uh, dispatching them and and uh, you know raising objections to them one after the other. <laughs> and it turns out in the end that uh, you know spoiler alert the, the monsters are all kids in costumes anyway, and then the kids start messing with them, and that's where it really goes south for him. And <laughs> it kind of turns. I mean, the whole thing is sort of a meta fictional book, of course. The, the narrator is talking directly to you and to Vader. And then Vader realizes that that uh, the thing you should really be afraid of is you, the reader, because you can trap him inside the book, and you only have to let him out when you want to. Um, so that leads to I've actually had a lot of objections to this page. People don't like being reminded of the big no scene with Vader. But all of my picture books start out uh, as real rough sketches. So here's a typical page of a sketchbook where I planned out a whole picture book and just like really messy thumbnails, each rectangle, a, a page and a book. And then, you know, after some character exploration with the monster, I did, obviously I wasn't going to redesign Vader. I think I made his head a little bit larger than uh, would be standard, but otherwise I, I didn't really mess with him any. But uh, I kept making the monsters cuter and cuter just to ensure that Vader himself would be the scariest thing in the book. And then the background of this book is actually a photograph of a model that I made. Um, I kind of like doing this sometimes. The, the characters themselves are just drawings and paintings, but uh, I was so taken as a kid, whenever I would get to see any little making of featurette that would be on TV of, uh, you know, how they did the, the big Hoth battle scene or or how they use stop motion and, and miniatures in this way or that. So I thought it would be fun if I made a miniature myself and photographed that to be, to be the background. So it started off as this garbage, just some floral foam from a craft store, uh, then covered with clay and sculpting the clay out into vines and roots and texture, throwing all kinds of stuff on, on it, sponges, moss, literally taking it outside and throwing dirt at it um, so that it would have more realistic texture and then painting it up to form the backdrop for the book with a number of other things, other assets that I made. And I also made a, a Death Star out of a globe that I bought at Target. Uh, so that's what after it was painted up nicely, it ended up being in the background of this piece. So there's that. That is so cool. That is amazing. I love anything to do with, I love all of that. Like I love Jim Henson. So anything to do yeah. with like behind the scenes, sculpting, like the makeup, making all the figures and puppets. I think that is just the coolest thing ever. All right, Lindsay, I think you touched on Hux research, but. <laughs> What was the most fun? I think there was a bathrobe involved. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, so in the Phasma book, uh, Hux wears a bathrobe. And there is a pretty good description of what the bathrobe looks like. So I got a bathrobe, piped it, put on, I did all the work for it. It has to be ironed. It is very explicitly an ironed bathrobe because Hux, everything in his, his wardrobe is ironed. <laughs> so I ironed that. Um, I also uh, made, I uh, got powder blue pajamas because blue, he, he has an ice blue couch in his, uh, his quarters. And so his I made vestibule. sure, yes, in his vestibule. <laughs> and I made sure that his pajamas matched his couch. That couch is very famous. <laughs> and I have worn that with uh, little uh, stormtrooper slippers because they don't make first order stormtrooper slippers and they don't make Kylo Ren ones either otherwise I would have worn Kylo Ren ones. Um, my big research pro luckily Hux's costume did not change much over the three movies and so I have not had to do much work on that. It is a 
unique costume and that it has the scenes are very difficult to see at times so we've had to get a lot of uh, luckily in the 501st there are a ton of people working on costumes and so you can always find someone who might get an angle of a costume that you don't have an angle of and can lighten it figure out where those seams are and figure it out i'm working on cal kestis right now from uh jedi fallen order and his costume is realistic but it is brutal because it is made for a scrapper and so he has so many accessories and his pants are so complicated that it is take i am a year and a half into that build and i'm not nowhere anywhere close but it is the amount of research that you have to do for star wars costumes to f figure out where where they might have sourced this how you can make it realistically without breaking the bank is is always a is always a challenge, but it's a, a it's a fun challenge. It's one of my favorite things to do. Lindsay, can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. Aren't there? I feel like I've heard that there have been cases where, like, official Star Wars productions have turned around and actually borrowed stuff from the cosplayers. Didn't they do that with Mandalorian? Maybe. Yes, the Mandalorian season one. I can't remember which episode it is. I think it's the episode. I think <clears throat> it's the final episodes with. Um, Moff Gideon at the end of season one are using 501st Stormtroopers. That's so cool. That's so okay. impressive. And then Delilah, any fun or interesting research you've done for any of your Star Wars books? Well, you know, my, my first piece for Star Wars was The Perfect Weapon about uh, Bazim Natal, the mercenary in Maz Kanata's castle. And I thought they were going to like ship me like a book that looked like an old family Bible in the South, you know, like nine inches thick, like gilded, old worn leather. And like you flip it out and the, you, know, you think that there's like a Star Wars Bible and there's not. I was like, okay, well, what information can I have? And they're like, oh, just Google first the, the Force Awakens spoilers. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do that. But uh, yeah, so, you know, with, with, with legends being separate from canon, uh, like we have Wikipedia and then we have a, a whole team of people um, who, you know, copy edit the book and, and help us get it right so like when I first opened Phasma and my edits came back word crashed because there were 17 people arguing about whether you could have this kind of ship in this time because of what was happening in the quad drive yards um <laughs> so some of it happens on the back end uh but my my best my best experience with it was you know I wrote Phasma and um then we like the week before we went to print, we got a call that was like, hey, would you mind if we changed uh, the spy's name? Her name was Amaka Marathi. And they asked if we could change it to Vi Marathi. And we were like, sure, like you're, you're Star Wars. You can do whatever you need to do. And they're like, we might use her in one of the parks or something. And we were like, that's awesome. Like you can change your name to Mud if you want to. Like, that's so cool. We didn't hear anything else about it. And we were like, oh, well, you know, who knows? And then, you know, they had one of the, a big, Kind of like reveal at d23 or whatever and there was like this one little card that was like by marathi faces down the stormtroopers and she kind of looked like a, a computer generated barbie with and and we were just like oh my god like why is vi in here why is vi on like a trading card and then we found out she was going to be in the parks so it was a huge big deal like we did not know this um and as black spire was you know getting close to publishing we realized that if they could work it out right i could actually get into galaxy's edge and walk around before we went print so I got to go to the um the first opening out in LA like their soft opening night to walk around and then I had like two days with the book to make any changes based on because you know, writing a book a place like I have a pdf that's 169 pages with no order and no way to search um because it's so protected so it was very hard to say like you know well if you came out of Ronto Roasters do you go left or do you go right so um I had to do like this quick edit and I'm like walking around taking all of these notes on you know this like fancy 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 night and I'm like where is the Trilon wishing tree um but it was one of the coolest things in the world to have you know read of all of these documents and set a book in this world and then to get to actually physically walk through that world and meet the characters it was, it was mind-blowing that is so so cool I get so excited when I see her. I, have, I mean, obviously the park's been closed for a long time, but getting to see her every time I go is one of the best experiences. I, I've met several of Vi's friends who look a lot like Vi and are very supportive of her. And they are such incredible, amazing women. I am in awe of everything that uh, Vi and her friends get to do. 
really quickly, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to everyone who's watching, everyone who's made comments. So Eddie, thank you. Jonathan, thank you. Kimber, thank you all for making little comments. And for everyone else who I can't see your name, thank you for watching. And remember that if you do ask a question or make a comment, you could possibly win one of these little Baby Yoda stickers. So comment, let us know that you're enjoying it and ask um, our participants some questions. And speaking of questions, I have a quick question for Ian. I don't know if you'll have an answer, but is there like a specific line that you like remember writing that you were like, okay, this is awesome. It sounds so great in like Shakespearean or is it just all the same? <laughs> uh i mean it's it, it's weird asking me like did i write something and then i was like that is so great uh, <laughs> uh I, I don't know I, it, like that question makes me think about like our like the most popular lines in in star wars right and and taking those and trying to imagine how they would happen you know and like so doing things like you know these are not the droids for which thou searched you know like that's that's fun you know but also, it, but also there were times when, um, you know, like I didn't want to mess with things very much. Um, like, no, I am your father. When Adam was talking, I was imagining that being a contraction, how different that would be. No, I'm your father, right? Would, would probably not work quite as well. But uh, yes. I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, um, uh, but that was one where I like, I, I hardly touched it. I, I think I, I think it's no, I am thy father in my you know, in my version, but yeah. So I don't know. That's what comes to mind immediately. I was just so curious. <laughs> okay. Let's see our actual question. Oh, okay. So what Disney plus star Wars shows are you looking forward to? Um, let's start with Adam. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm going to go with the boring answer and say, I just want the Mandalorian to come back. That works. I think I think we all feel that a little bit. <laughs> what about you, Lindsay? I'm really I, I'm really really excited about the Cassian Andor uh, story. Uh, I Rogue One is one of my favorite films, and I love Cassian, and I'm really glad that he's getting to tell his story. What, what little we we know about his backstory seems really interesting, so I'm excited to see that. I'm also feel excited about that Obi Wan Kenobi show. <laughs> And Delilah? I mean, I know it's it's kind of cheap, but like, I mean, everything, whatever they're going to put out there, I'm going to I'm going to absorb it. But um, I'm really excited about Obi Wan because I'm a big fan of Hayden Christensen, and I can't wait to see him on screen again. Um, super jazzed about any more Mandalorian. I get it all, although I don't know how they're going to make that work without Grogu. Um, and then also, um, yeah, what was the other one that I was thinking? Of? Oh, La uh, La um, Lando. Like I, if I can, I'll give me all the Donald Glover. I'll watch him in anything. Like you can recast every show on TV with Donald Glover and I'll be there. So everything seems amazing. And I believe Adam. Sorry, I, asked I went first. Okay, you went first. Who didn't I ask? My <laughs> answer was so Man. forgettable that just <laughs> washed um, over you. I mean, I'll say yes and to everything that everyone else has said, but uh, also the uh, Ahsoka series, you know, I'm um, looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, yep. As soon as I saw her appear in The Mandalorian, I thought this is about to be an offshoot. Um, yeah, so I was glad to hear it will be. So that actually leads very nicely into our next question that I feel could be an entire panel unto itself. Mandalorian season one or season two and why you preferred one over the other. Why don't we start with, well, Ian, you just finished one, you start us off. So I think I prefer season one. Um, and uh, part of that is it, season two, uh, season two felt a little bit like, uh, like Mando was sort of the Forrest Gump of the Star Wars galaxy, right? Where like he just kept having to be in these, in these places and meeting all these characters and, you know, like, and, and I think to a certain extent, obviously they were trying to start setting up certain series uh, to branch off. Um, and I sort of liked uh, the first season where uh, yeah, he was he was just kind of doing his own thing and it wasn't necessarily as connected to other things. Um, 
So that's what I'll say. Sounds good. Adam, how about yourself? I liked the earliest stuff because I wanted as much Werner Herzog as possible. I want I want an offshoot where it's just him traveling the galaxy, being disappointed with things. So I think that's that gives it just a little bit of the edge for me. And then Delilah, how about yourself? I mean, I, I don't think you can go wrong with any of it, but I, I mean, I do miss the Ugnaught. I like the fish lady. Like my, my favorite characters are not the, the humans, it's, it's the aliens and the, the strange, interesting people. So I like any, anything that's basically a, you know, they have kind of like the, the canon episodes and they have like the side quests. Like I, I really like the, the wacky side quests. Uh, Lindsay. Um, probably season one for a lot of the same reasons. I felt uh, as season two went on, it became less about the Mandalorian and more about setting up shows that we knew were coming in the future. So hopefully season three will focus on the Mando again, uh, on Din. Um, but season season two gave me Cobb Vanth and, Cobb Vanth in the flesh. And Oh God, good point. Uh, Timothy Oliphant and Cobb Vanth, who is a character I really loved in the books. I can't, and it gave me the frog lady. So it's really, really hard to choose. No, I totally understand. I was so excited to see Boba Fett return that it was just like, so good. Yeah, I was just like, you know, I'm a huge Boba Fett fan, Mandalorians. So I was like, that yeah, was all good. So that actually kind of leads me to a question a little bit um, for the authors and Lindsay. What Star Wars character would you like to portray uh, or that you would like your absolute dream one to write for? Or maybe there's a side character you want to follow along, like Frog Lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lindsay, why don't we start with you? Uh, like I said earlier, I'm working on uh, Cal Kestis from Jedi Fallen Order. He is a character that I really, really love. I think what we've, I think Jedi Fallen Order is one of the best Star Wars games we've gotten in a really long time. And I think the found family and just the storyline in that is great. I'm really excited to see where his storyline goes. Um, and I just, I adore that character. Uh, and I really, really love him. Um, and I'm genuinely like, I'm just excited about everything that's coming out recently. All the stuff with, um, I'm, I am blanking which is really, really bad. All the stuff that's came out, not the new Republic, the not the old Republic. The, High Republic? Yes. All that stuff's been really, really great. And I'm, I'm be very behind in it, but I've really been enjoying all of that, that stuff. And I'm excited to see where that's going. Fantastic. Ian, I know you've done all the Star Wars Shakespeare's. What about you? Do you have a character you want to follow or dream one? I mean, yeah, I have gotten to work, uh, write so many characters. And um, uh, so I'm going to take this answer two directions. I'd love to do a Shakespearean Rogue One um, because uh, I, it's one of my favorite Star Wars movies. And so I, I'd love to do that. Um, also, I, they let me um, change, Jar, change, basically change Jar Jar's character a bit so that when he talks to other characters, he's still really dumb like he is in the movies. But when he's on his own, he's actually very smart. It's not not the Darth Jar Jar theory, but it's just sort of the, the like, he, he knows what's going on and he's, he realizes that he's playing this role. And I, I thought for a while, it'd be really fun to write a, a Star Wars novel, um, you know, with, with like that Jar Jar depicted uh, to sort of change his story a little bit. Or I like the, I like the idea of the challenge of that. Like a Midsummer Night's Jar Jar? Yeah. It wouldn't have to be Shakespearean though. It would just be its own, its own thing. Adam, how about yourself? I don't, I don't know how to answer this, except that I, one of the ideas I ended up pitching was one that I knew they were never going to go for, but I, I really wanted to write. And it would have ended up being more of a, a chapter book or a middle grade novel um, where it would have taken place on, on Luke and R2's journey to Dagobah, where in my head canon, they would be waylaid by a wormhole or something through time and space and basically crash land on earth where they would learn that they are toy sized and they have to deal with the colossal problems of being in modern earth and the x-wing is its fuel cell is has ruptured so uh luke has to go you know 
basically invade suburbia and find some double A batteries that he can rig up to to get him back home again. And it's a super stupid idea. And of course, they were never going to actually go for it. But there's part of me that still wants to write that. Personally, I would read the heck out of that. Oh, that sounds fun. amazing. So, uh, Delilah, how about you? Well, I feel like the the Star Wars editors, um, you know, at Del Rey and the ones at Disney as well, seem to really put a lot of thought into the authors that they tap and the books that they want them to write. And so, I, I feel like anything they offered to me would be something that they thought I would be good at, which is, you know really flattering and also uh you know it makes you all the more eager to kind of like dive in there because there's this confidence behind you like it's not uh it's not kind of random they're like we want you to do this and you're like oh my god i want to do it um so i think anything they offered me i'd be down for but like my my dream book that i wish they would let me do is you know i've written uh phasma and then black spire and black spire is kind of in some ways a sequel to phasma um, but I would love to do a third book in this trilogy where on one hand we see that Phasma has, you know, escaped, like we think she's dead, no, because she's basically wearing like an, an armored, like a, she's like wearing a Hummer basically as her, as her armor and she escapes and goes to some, you know, minor planet where she again rises to prominence. And then where Vi Marathi, like they find out that Phasma is alive and they send Vi to like go kill her for good before she starts a new first order. So it's like, you know, we would see the predator and the prey, but kind of who's the predator and who's the prey, and then, you know, kind of ends in an explosive battle. So, if you're listening, Lucasfilm, let me write this. Yeah, I, I vote for that myself. Please. <laughs> oh, Jessica, you're muted. I think you're muted. I might have some technical difficulties, but Dan, your co-host. So if anything happens, it should be good. If not, um, it'll be very quick and we'll be back. But I'm hoping nothing happens. We will know in nine minutes. So we're on quest the next question, the fun question. Um, Wookiees or Ewoks? And this is, I think, a very important question. And let's start with Delilah. Oh, Ewoks. I, I'm, I'm Ewoks, Ewoks for life. Um, <laughs> like, that was, uh, so when Battle for Endor came out, it was like the first time I was allowed to stay up late and watch something after like nine o'clock and it imprinted on me in a big way. I was like, wait, I could crash on a planet and befriend murder bears? Like, <laughs> let's do this, that's my life. I could be the hero. So that was like my first, you know, it's like you said earlier, we couldn't just watch the Star Wars movies on demand. You had to wait to like, if it came on on a Sunday at three o'clock, if your dad happened to call you in and let you watch it. Um, so I, Ewoks, Ewoks are my boys. Like I love Wookiees. I'm here, I'm here for the Wookiees, but uh, murder bears forever. And Lindsay. I'm, I'm more of a Wookiee person. My parents are very, very anti-Ewok. So I was raised in an anti-Ewok household. I know, I was raised to cheer when they died. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Your parents might be bad people. They, they did not like that they were cuddly. I have learned to respect and like Ewoks. I like them now, but, but I, I will always go with, with Wookiees. I will, I will go with Wookiees, but I, I, I like, Ewoks now, but that some of that. Some I feel like that. this is like a bigger conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it puts you on the like, we'll kill with a Wookiee in a later book. Like a random person named Lindsay with two E's has arm ripped off by a very old, ugly Wookiee. <laughs> I'll be okay with that. Okay, Ian, <laughs> Wookiees or Ewoks? Wookiees, but I have no problem with Ewoks. <laughs> Uh, I just per I just prefer Wookiees a little bit. Yep. I feel I feel and like Adam? I'm escaping the wrath of Delilah here. <laughs> I think I'll go ahead and split it down the middle on that. I don't think I have a favorite anymore, but like I've gone on a real journey with this. Where when I was a kid, of course, I loved the Ewoks because I was I was little when when they were up on the big screen and. And I love those teddy bears. And I always loved, loved Chewbacca too, but 
later on, as I got older, I think I got influenced by all of the anti Ewok sentiment that um, Lindsay's parents apparently embody. <laughs> And now I've come back around to like, no, no, they were great. They were great. And I was right when I was a child, but, but I love, I love Wookiees too. Dan, I want to know from you. Me? Well, I'm looking up here. I don't have any Wookiees or uh, Ewoks to show. Personally, I'm more of a Wookiee fan. Chewbacca, they're fun, but Ewoks are a close second. How about you, Jessica? Ewoks? They are very cute. They're so compact. <laughs> and they're still little murder machines. Like they are no less lethal. Like mm -hmm. I'd argue they're more lethal. Well, we know they killed stormtroopers. We know they killed a girl exactly Leia's size and kept her dress. Like, oh, yeah, I was gonna say. A little dark. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I would love to hear about some of the other fun projects that you're all working on. Uh, Adam, can we start with you? Oh gosh, I uh, so I'm working on a couple things right now. I'm working on a novel that I guess is YA, and I, when I write something, I, I usually just write it the way that it feels like it needs to be written, and then figure out after the fact, or better yet, let my editor tell me after the fact what it actually is. So. I'm writing something that I wasn't sure if it was middle grade or YA, but I think it's going to end up on the YA side. And I'm uh, I'm working on a a series of chapter books about a silly little little wizard named Gumluck that I'm really happy about. So those are going to be heavily illustrated, and I'm sort of ensconced in illustrating those right now. Excellent, Delilah. Um, so a bunch of what I'm working on right now is secret, but I can tell you my next. Um... My next book is a middle grade horror book. It's like, oh, that's in glare. It's a Florida haunted hoarder house book. Um, so that's out this fall. Um, I have an as yet unannounced IP book that will be out later this year. And then in 2022, uh, I have my next big adult book, which is called The Violence, which is a generational saga pandemic of violence book. That's also out with Del Rey, who does the Star Wars books. Uh, and then I'm in an Aliens versus Predator anthology that's out this December. Oh, those all sound fun. Uh, Ian. Uh, I am working on, on writing my first novel right now. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned later this year, I'll, I'll go ahead and share really fast. Later this year, I have uh, Shakespeare's Avengers uh, coming out. So uh, the first or the four Avengers movies in a single single volume, four plays. Oh my God. Uh, and then uh, the uh, I Wish I Had a Wookiee children's book. So. Uh, it'll be an exciting day. They both come out September 28th, so uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And beyond that, I'm just working on raising two teenage sons. That's a lot of work. You already got one out to the shed. That's almost, <laughs> that's almost gone. Halfway there. That's right. That, that requires context because the listeners did not hear about the shed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's true. That was, that was before we started the live stream. Adam asked me if I was in this, you know, if I was also in an attic room, uh, I presume like, like you are. And, um, and uh, I mentioned that my 15 year old has moved out to what is, it's a big shed. I mean, it's <laughs> worse than it is, folks. Rubbermaid uh, does it. There's a rubber mat on the bottom. You just hose it out. Exactly. That's right. Uh, it is exactly <laughs> the domicile that he needs. All right, Lindsay, besides your uh, upcoming costume, are you working on any others or any dream costumes? I am in the Star Wars realm. I am working on uh, Rey's Jakku, her desert scavenger outfit, um, which is my favorite of all the Rey costumes. I just finished my indoor Leia costume. I am also working on a costume from the Dr. Afra, cost the Dr. Afra comics. From the Screaming Citadel uh, comics, there's a character who is the queen of a planet I can't pronounce, uh, but she's like a force vampire and she's super, super cool. And yeah, that's, that's, it's a lot of, I have a lot of things. We'll see if I get them done. <laughs> and I believe that we have a Facebook question 
Yay! Thank you, Lindy. So, her question is, did you guys own an Ewok doll when you were small? I'm going to say, or a Wookiee doll, or any doll. That's new Star Wars. I'm expanding the question. And I think the line was looking. Yeah, I'm like, you had that little like, one. I still have my Princess Nisa, but we, we moved a couple of months ago and we still haven't unpacked everything because I'm missing a whole other set of shelves that's supposed to be here. So I'm like, oh my God, I have a, I have a Princess Nisa um, from when I was a kid. I also had Paplu and Nippet, but I think my parents lost those when I was in college. Now I also have a Wicket. Um, I have several Porgs. I have this amazing Puffer Pig. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah I'm, I'm, are you saying are you saying there's a chance that princess nisa's in a box somewhere because that doesn't sound like a person who loves ewoks <laughs> um it's just kind of challenging when you you don't like i would just be a step no, fine, I just keep <laughs> wow so delilah has left to find the action figure uh ian how about yourself uh, I didn't have, I'm trying to think if I, I was big into stuffed animals, but I don't think I had any Star Wars stuffed animals. I had a lot of action figures uh, back in the day. Um, and and somebody made me, it's it's downstairs, but somebody made me a, uh, a knit Han Solo, uh, you know, recently. And that so that's a lot of fun, but that's as, as close as I come. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't either. I I feel like I didn't even have any of the Ewok action figures. Uh, just because of how old I am, I had all of the unpopular action figures from A New Hope because of, those were the only ones I could find. So all of the Cantina monsters, and basically that was it. I had uh, probably just about the full run of of uh, Empire figures, but then I convinced myself I was too old for them by the time Jedi came out. So even though I was still very much in the movie, into the movie, um, I felt embarrassed asking for toys at that point. No, I know the feeling. And Lindsay, how about yourself? Uh, I had quite a few of the action figures. I think I've, I, my, I moved around a lot, so I've lost, I think, most of them. Um, but I have a very, very, I, I may not like Ewoks that much, but I love Porgs a lot. Um, I have a huge Porg collection. Um, it, basically any pork that's put out, I own, including my little, my little shoulder pork. Um, I also am really, really a big fan of Tuka's of Lothcats. And if they put out Lothcats, I will buy it. Um, they, for Star Wars Day, they are putting out a new one for Galaxy's Edge in blue. Yes. And it's, I can't wait to go back so I can get my blue Lothcat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Then uh, Delilah, does it look like we found the action figure? Yeah, apparently she's uh, she's downstairs. We have a room. Uh, my husband's into Transformers as well as Star Wars, so we have a room where we just have all of our Transformers on display. And apparently she's down there. But I did find, I found Tarful and Wicket. So like the, you know, stuff's everywhere. <laughs> now, I mean, after this phone call, as I'm like charging downstairs, yeah. like, where's my baby? <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, we lost Jessica in the time you left. She'll be back. But she went uh, for Princess Nisa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, computer updates, uh, technology. <laughs> Can't stop Windows, kind of like the Empire. That depends. There's an analogy in there somewhere. I'm reaching. So, <laughs> so we are on May the 4th, and this is a holiday that started back in 2011. Uh, before we get to our closing questions, can you all share with me some of your favorite May the 4th? memories over the last few years and we'll start with uh lindsay so may the 4th is really really big in the 501st and the rebel legion all of the basically the big charity star wars organizations sadly the past couple of years because of of covid we haven't been doing a lot of trooping but the last the year before in 2000 i guess 19 i mean I did five troops in a day. I mean, we basically spend the entire day basically trying to see how many of us can do as many troops as possible. Um, we do a lot of library troops, which are some of my favorite troops to do, where we go and costume, read read books to kids, do Star Wars activities with kids. It's, it's one of the best things. But like those those are my favorite interactions. Um, just interacting with kids who are so excited about Star Wars and getting to do stuff in character with them and getting to share the love of Star Wars with a new generation. 
and doing things like that is just one of the the best things and getting to do volunteer work on this day is just it's the best i i genuinely love it yeah we've had very lucky to have had the 501st come out to several of our library events here at escondido and it always adds a certain special nests for the kids and the adults the kids are just like the kids they're just as excited to see the costumes and uh everything uh ian how about yourself any favorite star wars day memories yeah so a couple um a few years ago i, g- I got to do an event on may 4th at my local library here which is the local library that i grew up going to when i was a kid so to to go back to that place that i loved uh and and to be able to do it as a star wars author that was that was really special and then actually last year during uh during covid um a a new shakespearean group popped up at the very beginning of covid uh to do zoom performances of shakespeare and called the show must go online and um they ended up doing uh a a series of of some of mine and we were able to get permission um through quirk books and lucasfilm to do some scenes from uh, Shakespeare's Star Wars. And so that happened a year ago today. Uh, you know, uh, we did a Zoom performance um, that was fun and ridiculous and, uh, you know, uh, featured all sorts of great costumes and uh, quasi Shakespeare and Star Wars uh, things. And yeah, it was great. Uh, Delilah. Um, so we, we, we've lived in, uh, Florida for the past four years before we moved back up to Georgia this year. Um, but we had a, a May the 4th where my husband's birthday is, is Revenge of the 5th. So we went to Disney World with just the two of us. And uh, I had my, my little Death Star ears on and I was wearing my Star Wars dress. And I went to Hollywood Studios in time to see the Phasma Parade. It was like very close to when Phasma came out. And I was just sitting there just like being very emotional. I'm like, you're real. Um, so yeah, it was being like in the middle of Star Wars on May the 4th is, is magical. It really is. And then Adam, how about yourself? Now, before COVID, I did semi-regular school visits. Uh, you know, a lot of children's authors and illustrators are invited to just talk to schools and show how books are made and that kind of thing. And it's always a good audience because, you know, it's a captive audience of kids that are just happy to to not be in math or whatever. So I, for a couple of, I think the year that Are You Scared Darth Vader came out and maybe the year or two after that, I was invited to schools and actually coordinated with the guys here in Tucson who are the official Vaders in Tucson, who have the, uh, you know, the 501st uh, quality costumes. And, and so they would uh, come along to the schools with me and gesticulate and shake their fists at me for humiliating them and, and so forth. That, that was really fun. That's excellent. All right, Jessica, did you have any of those other questions you wanted to ask? I don't know what, <laughs> what so you asked while I was gone. I asked what favorite <laughs> May the 4th memory was had. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to go back and watch what I missed because that was a really good question. I, I'm just going to check to see if Facebook has any, anyone has commented. I have not seen My any computer restarted, questions. so I lost everything. So there were a oh, couple no. of comments that, oh, well, I'm with Lindsay's parents about the Ewoks. My parents were wrong. <laughs> but uh, other than that, lots of, lots of love for the audience, uh, from the audience to the uh, authors and our guests. I just feel like that's going to be like a great, if you ever write like a memoir, Lindsay, like that would be the title <laughs> of your parents, the entire chapter. Yeah, my dad, t- I mean, my dad still does not like them <laughs> to this day. Um, yeah, just, just a lot of comments. Lindy, Kimber, Eddie, Jonathan, everyone who's watching, thank you, thank you. And I guess we'll get into the closing questions then, unless you have any other ones, Dan, that you wanted to ask. I mean, a billion, but I want to be respectful of our guests' time. Okay. So then let's go on to what is your favorite library memory? And let's start with Adam. 
I feel like all my favorite library memories are actually ones that it's, it's more of taking my kid to the library now or or visiting libraries and speaking to them. I loved going to the library when I was a kid, but I wasted all my childhood at the library um, because I think I alluded to the fact that I had, you know, mistakenly decided that I was too old for toys by the time Return of the Jedi came out. And this was all because I had a, a brother who was three years older than I was and oh, still do. And he, I, I felt this compulsion to keep up with him. So whenever I would go to the library when I was a kid, I would pick out something that my brother would read, take it home, realize it was way above my, my level, uh, ignore it for two weeks and then take it back to the library again. So I guess that's a- I'm just gonna go. Yeah, just kids, you know, read, read whatever you wanna read. Uh, now, now I'm a 47 year old man who owns like 500 picture books, but I, you know, like I said, I wasted my childhood. Well, I don't think you're ever too old to start reading picture books. I like them. They're great. It's my endorsement. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> okay, so Ian, what's your favorite library memory or memories? Um, I mean, just days of going to the library with my mom, um, the local library that I just mentioned earlier, um, and looking for the, the books that had, they all had J in front of the call number for juvenile, which was the, the section, um, you know, and, uh, and just this feeling of freedom of like, oh, I can, I can take any of these home if I want to, uh, and, and taking a big stack of books home. Uh, it was always a great feeling. And I'm, I am an avid user still of my local library system, uh, which we're very lucky to have a, a good library system here. Uh, and I use it all the time. And this, this question actually made me think, I'm going to sh show one more thing uh, here. Uh, when I did Attack of the Clones and I, and I had Obi-Wan uh, visiting the uh, Jedi archives, uh, I embedded this acrostic in this, in this scene between Jocasta and Obi-Wan uh, where it says librarians are awesome down the yeah. uh, down the side there of the first letter of each line. That's so, uh, I just love libraries. Yeah, I love that. Oh, <laughs> you want delivery? <laughs> I feel better now. Hey, Delilah, you're next because I feel like you're ready. <laughs> I'm defended now by 1983. <laughs> um, yeah, so a long, long time ago, when in order to get a, a movie, you had to go to the video store and rent a VHS cassette a thousand years ago. Uh, I was in there with my dad in second grade, and I saw this really cool looking cartoon, and I brought it to my dad. I was like, can I rent this? And he was like, Watership Down? No, you can't rent that. That's like very, very violent. And I was like, it's a kid's movie. And he was like, it's not. Um, and so I got kind of like pissed about that. So I went to my school library and I looked up Watership Down and I took it to the librarian and was like, I want to read this book. And she was like, oh, you can't, honey. That's a fifth grade book. That's way too violent for you. So I got really mad. So I put it in my backpack and took it. <laughs> and I read it and I was like, this is the best book I've ever read in my whole life. And then I put it back. Like I didn't, I didn't steal the book. Like I remember it was one of those like hard leather bound kind of library ones that you could probably throw down off a skyscraper and it would be fine. And I like, I read it and then I took it back and responsibly put it back exactly where it went. And it, to this day, is one of my very favorite books. And um, I just remember that sense of like, the library is for reading. Like, why won't you let me read this book? Like, I get why my dad won't pay money to rent the movie, but like, let me read the book. But then, you know, I also, you know, did the same thing with like Pet Cemetery and It when you're not mm. supposed to read those when you're 11. So I think that explains a lot about me now. But yeah, I totally stole from the library. You temporarily borrowed and returned. I did yeah. borrow, just nobody wrote it down. You took it for a joyride. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you're younger, we all have that book or movie that we were told we couldn't watch. And then later we watched it. Mine was Jurassic Park and I'll never, <laughs> I had so many nightmares after watching that. Oh man, but I completely understand. And Lindsay, what's your favorite library or library's memory? 
So I moved around a lot as a kid. So libraries were always like a place that I could go. And it was, you know, no matter what, I could always go to the library and get books. I was a, a vivacious reader. But I think one of my favorite memories. Um, so when I was in college, my I wrote my thesis on uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and all of his books. And we went on spring break to Washington, D.C. And there were some books in the Library of Congress that I wanted to check out. I wanted to read for my for my my thesis. And I was able to get a Library of Congress library card and like go in and like Xerox some pages. And while I, I don't even think I ended up using any of the research I did there, like the coolest thing to me was that like, I got a library of, like anybody in the world, anybody who's an American, like anybody who's a citizen can get a library of Congress card. And it was like the, it was like the big league library. So like I had the big league library card and I, the fact that like, I was like in my twenties but I felt like a little kid again, being like, I have this library card. It's the coolest library card. <laughs> and I still have it somewhere, even though it's like well expired. It was just the coolest thing I could have got. I felt like I could have gotten, oh, I'm a big nerd. <laughs> Not like us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you are in the place of nerds right now. <laughs> this is a nerd space. <laughs> And I think we already asked about what fun projects you're working on, but I'm going to ask what's next for you. Are there any events you're doing soon that you want to talk about or anything that you want to take this time to promote? And let's start with Adam. I don't think so. Uh, all my stuff is kind of tied to the school year, which is wrapping up now. So I, I don't know what it is. There's, you know, like love of reading week and, and you know, book months and things. I, I always end up being booked solid from like February through March, but uh, no, now I'm kind of free and clear to just actually write and illustrate things. Awesome, and Ian. I don't think I have anything else. I don't have any events coming up and, and uh, until the books come out in September, uh, I'm, I'm just sitting and waiting. There's a lot of waiting in the publishing industry. <laughs> yeah. And Delilah. Yeah, until the cons come back, my, my schedule is really sadly empty. Um, although on Thursday, I am interviewing Andy Weir about his latest project, uh, Project Hail Mary. It's a really good book. Like I, I really dug that book. So uh, it's through Barnes and Noble. Uh, it's up on Eventbrite if you look at my Instagram or Twitter, you can find a link to it, which I'm Delilah S. Dawson everywhere, but very much looking forward to, to talking to him about that book. That's really cool. Yay. And Lindsay, any so, final first stuff, any stuff that's just you? Yeah, well, with things slowly opening up in some places, depending on where people live, um, you know, every everybody's kind of different right now. There are, you know, we are slowly being able to take events and I'm not just talking here in the local San Diego area. I'm talking all across the world. If you are looking for the 501st or anybody, the 501st to do a charity event, you can go to the 501st website and there's a place where you can contact us and get, they will get in touch with your local organization. So you can get Star Wars characters out to do, help with you know volunteer work and things like that. We are always happy to do charity work with, you know, and work with you guys on volunteer stuff, you know, we are more than happy and we love to do it. That's why we exist. And so with, we, we want to help you. So come contact us. And also for anybody who wants to join us, come, come find out. You can go to the 501st website and find your local garrison, look into doing Star Wars. Cause again, it's for everyone. It doesn't matter what character you want to do, what, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. If there's a character you want to, create and be, you can do it. Okay, and I think that's gonna kind of wrap us up for the day. Thank you again for everyone that joined us. Big thank you to our panelists for this. This was excellent. Uh, if we could talk for five hours on Star Wars, I would, but you know how that goes. So we have a short survey that we would ask all of our viewers to fill out. It's in the event description and we will have pasted it in the comments. And make sure to order the author's books at the Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. Support these wonderful folks. Yes. And if you're interested in more free online programs like this, 
check out our Facebook event to see everything that we have planned. And our next um, free live streamed author event will be Friday, May 7th at 3 p.m. So make sure to check that out. And I'm just going to say thank you to everyone watching. Thank you to Kimber, to Lindy, to Eddie, Jonathan, everyone who I can't see, but I can see the eyeball numbers. So I know that you're watching. Everyone watching now or live, everyone watching later. Thank you so much. And we hope that you purchase the books, check out the authors, check out the 501st, and have a wonderful Star Wars day. So we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you.